Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, innovation and innovation in the flower and floriculture. And I, I want to talk about how uh, floriculture in the last 20 years has changed more than it has, has changed in the last hundreds of years. There's been huge market changes which has really affected how research and innovation is done in floriculture today. And I want to talk about how you can use things like market mapping, uh, things like framing the business to, how, to, for you to make decisions on how we can innovate better for the future. So let's talk a little bit about where we're at, where we were so we can figure out where we're going to go. This is a, a map of the, the flower business um, that's why you have it like this. There's no way to do that. Um, the flower business is, say, in the, in the 70s, early 80s, and before. Uh, in that world, flowers were grown locally. These are cut flowers, by the way. Um, and consumption was pretty much in the north. And you can see the equator um, in, the, in the middle there. A lot of plant people. Why, why do flowers grow well at the equator? Can anyone name a couple reasons? Lights, one, why, why is there more light? Well, at the equator, you're at the, the bulge of the earth, and most flowers are grown high on mountains. Uh, so there's more light. Why else? Somebody said it, temperature. And then I'll give you the last one, it's labor. Labor's cheap. In a cut flower, 40% of the cost is labor. It's a lot of labor to go cut those things. So, and the, everything starts to move to the equator. But even you have a lot of flowers. In 1990, the, uh, the, the peak of California supplied 95% of cut flowers to the United States in 1990. Uh, today it is less than 2%. So that's how fast this whole world's changing. So again, if we look at the north, that's where the flowers are grown, right by where they're actually consumed. The biggest consuming areas are Europe, Japan, and the United States. And that's where most of the things are. Let's look at research in the United States, how it mimics that market at the time. If you look at the map here, uh, cut flower research is the, the, the bouquet looking sticker, and the potted plant is potted the pot with the flower in it. So there's quite a few research organizations all over the United States in the 80s and 90s, and a lot of experts running around, a lot of research being done. I estimate there was nine major cut flower research stations in the United States and 12 major bedding and potted plant. A huge thing happened in the 90s that, that changed all of our businesses. Mass market decided they were going to sell cut flowers. So we went from a retail florist who was selling to an individual to a, what was a HEB who wanted I need a million of the same bouquets next week, and I need them at two, 300 stores. No distribution system was set up in the United States to do that. So it changed everything in a very short time. And really, the supermarkets getting into the United States was pretty much the demise of a uh, California grower. So here we are today. Look at the United States, there's almost no growing. Less than 2% is grown in the United States. Uh, Mexico really grows what they consume. And most of the growing, I'm gonna try and use this pen now, yeah. Charlie, let's see. Goes like this today. So the distribution systems are <coughs> south to north. Almost every rose that you buy today is, is grown here in Ecuador or in, in uh, Colombia and shipped to the United States. In, in Europe, almost every rose that is uh, purchased there is either grown in Kenya or Ethiopia, and all is shipped up, the, up north. So that's basically what, what has hugely changed the way the distribution of flowers go. Does that make any questions? So we look at how that's changed research. Look at where the growers are no longer and whereas research is no longer. So if we look at growers are non-existent, and then I think there is a correlation between growers shrinking in numbers and the amount of universities that actually do research in that. And, and if you look at 
how can we, how can we change that? What, we can, what can we do to make that different? Um, I estimate there's about one and a half, I think I'm being generous on cut flowers as far as research universities. And then the potted plants have decreased significantly, but still quite a few. This was very interesting uh, when I started mapping this. Why? Because potted plants are still grown in the United States. Potted plants are, are still local in the United States. Now that distribution has changed quite a bit, where it's consolidated considerably, which I think has shrank <coughs> research. But cut flowers have disappeared, and the research basically has disappeared with it. And, and that's pretty concerning. So if we look at the potted business, uh, similar change but not extreme. The Home, home, de home, home Depot Lowe's effect and the consolidation of, of growers has really changed something. As if anyone's ever heard of uh, the Porter, Porter's effects, he's a business guy that, that did a lot of analysis on, on who has all the control. Well, in the flower business in the 80s, the growers had all the control. They had all the power. They were selling to 900,000 different customers. Now they can be selling to two. So all of a sudden, the buyers have the control. Why does that matter for, for research? Well, the problem is, is if you have two people do, have, that have the control, there's not money going into research. So how do we change what we're doing in order to, to facilitate these market changes? Doesn't, I'm, I don't want to be negative, it's actually positive. Uh, corporate research actually has grown, but will never be enough in order to compensate for the fact that, that uh, university research has gone down. If you take Floralife as an example, we went from one researcher, one technician, I was that one researcher in the 90s, and now we, we have grown quite a bit to a couple research labs. Potted plant didn't make that change. I think a lot had to do because of the difference in how the market changed. So the growth in private research is due to the decline in public research? Yes, I think in a big way. Uh, because to give you an example, so when we make a product, we have flower food. For me to make a new flower food takes about 20 uh, experiments. So each experiment has about 100 vases. And, and if I went, I went to Wageningen once and asked them, how much would it cost them for me to do that one test? They, they quoted me $30,000. I know I can do that test for about $1,200. So why would I go to a university? The overhead at universities has gotten so expensive that I, would, I won't go until the end. I'll do all the research myself and then I'll go to the university and have them do the last test. So I can frankly put their name on it and say they did it. And that's not a great, that's not a great solution for the universities. Can this change? I think it can change. The markets change. Look at the cut flower business, the retail florists who have went from in the United States, 26,000 retail, flor retail florists to about a little over 12,000 now, and that's in about 15 years. But they figured, they figured it out. They're moving. They're moving to events. The storefronts are going away. They're moving to the internet. The industries can change. This is business life cycles right here. So in a business life cycle, and this is true for a lot of different things, it just starts. And there's an acceleration. People like it, they buy, they buy, they buy. They get competition, more competition. The price gets out of the market, and then they disappear. Or they move on to something else. This is, this is used in biology. It's used in business. It's used in a lot of different things. But we can see that the retail florists move from basic retail florist to events. So they went from the going away to a, a, now they're actually accelerating, and you see, you see event people going up. Supermarkets are the same. In the last, the year before last was the first time supermarkets ever declined in cut flowers. 
So they're looking to reinvent themselves. Uh, right now, Walmart has put their own bouquet operations in the United States and also in uh, UK. So they're now making their whole distribution line themselves. They haven't bought farms yet, but I think you're going to see them try to make their own bouquet operations. The internet <coughs> is growing a lot. Farm to consumer. Uh, I was at a retail florist in Boise, Ohio, or Idaho. Probably you mind Boise or Idaho. There's got to be a small retail florist. This retail florist did only one thing. They did weddings. They do 1,000 weddings a week. And those, they never touch the product. The weddings are put together in Colombia and Bogota. And the wedding is about this size. They're boxed up. The boutonnieres, all the holders are made by very cheap labor. The flowers are grown at the farm. They're boxed up, put in a box, and sent to the bride in two days. All for under $500. So that's growing. That's farm direct to consumer. And that's really going to change a lot as it relates to how we do flowers, too. So the supply chain is collapsing quite a bit. And people are trying to reinvent how we do flowers. This gives you an idea of how people have changed where they're buying. If you look in the 80s, again, the retail florist, they ruled the world. You had to buy flowers there. Slowly changed. Supermarkets came in in the 90s. And now you've got the internet, which is what's growing high. And then you have supermarkets and retail florists. But again, we can get flowers in so many different places now. I'm good. There's going to be a research point to all this in a bit. I know it. So I'm also the head of the, of, uh, the, the research committee at, at American Floral Endowment. American Floral Endowment was kind of, they give grants to researchers like in this room. Now they were built when the world had all these growers. And they're kind of made to support organization like that. So if you went, five years ago, if you went to their board, it was all a bunch of growers sitting around. And they would decide who got the grants. But you saw my map. So 20 years ago, there was probably 10 cut flower growers and 10 potted growers. Five years ago, there was 20 potted growers and zero cut flower growers. Where do you think all the money was started to go? It all went to potted plants. So the whole thing started to feed in on itself. And Money was feeding AFE grants, but the money was all going for potted and bedding plants. So that was the conundrum that everybody is in, and it's the same conundrum that universities are in. The organizations are built to support a market that really has changed from under them. And I'm suggesting we need to relook at it in a different way. I can tell you in the, at AFE we are. Um, I mentioned here that we had zero cut flower proposals sent in the last two years to AFE for money. We have pots of money begging people to take it. No one even wants it. So this year, we went to uh, two universities and we, we actually asked them to do, here's the, the research we want. In this case, it was botrytis. We'd like these three things doing to do. We'll pay for you to go to Bogota and do all the studies. And by the way, here's a check. And that wasn't easy. Even that wasn't easy. But we started. We have two studies going now. <clears throat> One was now in Clemson. The other's in uh, North Carolina, both of which we had to recruit the researchers. I just noticed I have a typo here. I uh, hope there's not good spellers in the audience. Um, surprised I caught it. Um, so that's the way things are changing. But again, it goes to the, the point I'm trying to make is the research organizations of, the, of the, the world or the United States haven't adjusted to the markets that have, are changing from underneath them. And they're changing quickly. And I think we have to figure out how to change that. University research is still needed, 
Um, we company, uh, we're not going to do basic research. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that maybe Syn the Syngenta, I know there's somebody, there's somebody from Syngenta, those guys do basic research. We can't afford it. It'll never get done and cut flowers. Um, so we need the universities to work. You guys are important. So let's, some of the things I've seen that have worked, and we're going to go into more of those a little bit, but uh, research groups have gone out and looked for uh, what companies want. Who's your customer? So you can't, the days of sitting back and, and using the old system isn't, aren't going to work anymore. And what's the group I belong to? Floricultural Research Alliance. You belong to it also. Floricultural Research Alliance is a great example of that. Um, it's funny, we've got the, uh, th there's two ways to look at, you don't mind if I use this example, do you? We're talking about the car. Um, there's two ways that researchers have always wanted to get money. One, I call the, the I'm the scientist, I'm the rock star way. And that's I'm going to get the money, and it's me going to the USDA, it's me going to NIH, it's me, me, me doing this. That way's kind of old. It's great if you can do it, but not everyone can be Michael Jordan. The other way is now that's working is having consortiums. Ten universities getting together, we pay $10,000 to get in, and they're guaranteed to me, and the reason I like it is because I get the information before anybody else does. So I'm the customer. Figure out why we want the money. We want the money as businesses so we can compete better. If you can figure out a way to capture that value for me, companies will pay for it. But the value of, of the old school research, I don't think is there as much anymore. Let's talk about, I'm going to go a little bit more of that as we strewn into the talk. I'm going to also talk about some technologies that are coming up. If you look at um, the differences in cut flowers now and, and potted plants and bedding plants, cut flowers are totally global now, which creates a lot of other problems but a lot of opportunities. Potted and bedding plants are still pretty much local as it relates to grown in a country. If you look at some of these, what to watch. Uh, how, who can guess how long roses are stored for? A cut rose before you get it on Valentine's Day. Anyone guess? Yeah, I know you all can guess. <laughs> they are dry stored. Six months. Oh my God, I'd love it, I wish. Um, she said six months. They can't. That, that would be. They do that with apples, but not with roses. Um, three weeks is close. Four, four to six weeks now. They'll, they can cut a rose, put it in, control that, control the atmosphere if that's the right cultivar, and they can store it from four to six weeks. And then, then it's shipped from Columbia or Kenya, or, or then it sits in our transportation system for another ten days, and then you might get it. That's an extreme that only happens on the holidays. But those are the kind of things that are happening now and are important. Don't you think you have to be careful about the pot plants and the reason pot plants are cucurbit better? I think Q37, as it relates to the, it, it, uh, e, yes, I agree with that. Even though if you took away Q37, um, but let's go somewhere there, where there isn't. Q37 is about importing soil and things like that in the United States. Uh, let, go, to, go to Europe where there is no Q37. Europe, it's still pretty local. I don't know that the logistics is really set up for that. I mean, I, this conversation, do, do, what do you think? Okay, that's a very good point. So uh, you could get a lot of potted plants from Mexico and, yeah, and Canada, that's, that's right. Um, I agree Q37 had, has an effect, no, no question in my mind. Um, when I look at the places where there is no Q37, I don't see that having a huge effect. It's still, go to Europe, most of the stuff's still pretty locally grown. Cut flowers. 
Uh, Mexico, why, why aren't all the flowers coming from Mexico? They consume them all. It's, it's a pain to ship to the United States. We are picky consumers. We want cheap prices, and I need a million uh, quality cut flowers, and I need them next week, and you better ship them. I think it's, Mexicans would rather ship to Mexico. They've told me that. It, they make the same amount of money, and it's, they don't have to deal with the head buyer of Kroger. Um, so I'm not convinced that if you took Q37 away that it would be the panacea. I agree it's an issue, but it would be interesting to see what would happen. Uh, sea freight is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, as an example, uh, some of the storage time that I told you could be on a sea container coming from uh, Mombasa, Kenya to Amsterdam. They'll sit on a boat in a sea container, and that's about a four-week ride, a three to four-week ride by itself. And roses ship up that way now. And then just the distribution's going to change um, with cut flowers, that's for sure. And I'm going to show you. Let me go back to now. It's this way. The other big thing that's going to change <clears throat> is this. So remember I said it goes up and down? This is going to start in the next couple of years, and it has already started. I, this map doesn't let me do the right way, but things are going to start moving sideways. Uh, the airport in, in, in Nairobi is going to open up. They'll start shipping flowers to Atlanta, supposedly next year. They've been saying next year for some years now. But when that happens, things are going to start going back and forth. The Colombians are now buying farms in Kenya and Ethiopia. And the world is now going like this again. So I think the cut flowers are going to become yet more global again. <clears throat> what to watch? I I think, and I, there was an article in uh, Chemical and Engineering News about, about CRISPR and type of technologies like that. Um, who, CRISPR is, who knows what CRISPR is? Like a refrigerator? Mm, like a refrigerator, but not. <laughs> oh, that CRISPR, you're right. That's good. Never even thought of that. Um, OK, so uh, genetically modified plants are now required to be registered by the government. So if you have a new, new plant of petunia, it has to go through a big registration process, very expensive, kind of a pain in the neck, so it doesn't happen very often. There's a new technology called CRISPR, which is an acronym, and if somebody is in here that actually knows what it is without Googling it, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a dollar. Uh, but it's a big, long, and, uh, and it means that they can now insert, take out, and move genes around within a plant which is new, and the, and the US EPA and USDA has said, you do not have to, look at these Googling, I'm not giving you any money if you, if you uh, the, they have said you do not have to register it as a GMO. To me, that's huge. Some scientists have said, eh, it's another, not a big deal. But now you can take a rose, and can you, or a carnation, or a petunia, can you turn off the ethylene function by changing an internal gene? Maybe. And if you can do that, you don't have to register it. And that saves about five years and a couple hundred thousand dollars in money. And I think it'll start to happen in floriculture. I think it's going to be a big deal in floriculture. Uh, water. Water is going to be a, a huge deal. I have a map on that. I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute, a little bit. How am I doing? Good. Uh, lighting. Um, I don't, I, I'm bringing this up because I, I think there's been a lot of uh, new things in lighting, but I can tell you, at, and I've been ahead of the committee for four or five years at AFE, maybe before this year we had one or two lighting proposals. This year we had five. Uh, I think maybe it's Philips great marketing. They give everyone free lights, and then the, you guys come to us for money. But uh, I, I'm amazed that that's, that seems to be something there. So lighting is becoming an issue, issue as a new technology issue. Post-harvest is hard to find. That's a hint of, of there's money to get, and, and people want to support that research. 
so it's there. Disease and pest resistance will always be there in basic research. But I think those are the things that we, we need. Why did you put oranges in the disease and pests? Oh, good. I'm glad you see that. Very good. Uh, no, because I, I think the reason that's important in si and basic research is important is uh, the current orange crisis, uh, there's a, uh, there's a disease called, sit, thank you, um, which basically they, they don't have a solution for it. And likely we'll have to use GMO to solve it. So you'll now, you, you might all be eating GMO oranges whether you like it or not, or not eating oranges. So I, I think that um, that's, it, that's why I put that in there. Thank you. Oh, I forgot the name of the disease. Um, what else to watch? <clears throat> this is cut flowers. Kenya, we talked about international uh, export and import. Exchange rates are a big deal, whether you believe it or not. Um, if you looked at, to give you a quick example on exchange rates, so the dollar got really strong. You probably read that somewhere in the paper. And Colombia, which grows 90, or Ecuador, Colombia grow probably 88% of our flowers in the United States. Um, the peso stayed here. The dollar got really strong. It drove about 30% of the growers out of business. So those kind of things can make huge, huge factors and events happen just by simple exchange rate changes. Storage technologies, we talked about that. Adjacent possible, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, consumption trends, big deal for growers. Uh, let me tell you a, a good, interesting current example. So um, Russia's got a problem, right? They run out of money. And Russia loves big, big roses. I, they love roses, and I'm not kidding, that are this big, the heads are this big, and they cost 20 bucks a, a stem. Huge, they love huge roses. Well, those are hard to afford when you run out of money. So what has happened is the whole country of Ecuador, 60% of their export was to Russia, and they were built on making these huge roses. The Russians decided, you know what, maybe we don't really need these huge roses. Maybe I'm gonna like those African roses that are this big, and they changed all their consumption, all's a big word, a lot of their consumption changed to these small roses. And a lot of those times, that doesn't come back. So consumption trends, we need to watch as to what's important to the market. Climate change, uh, that has, I'll show you another graph on water and that, and CRISPR we talked about. You want this example? What, there's, go ahead. That's it, I knew it. It's a really cool technology. And that's a cool name too, so it's gotta be cool. Um, so this is a good thing if we're looking at um, climate change as it relates to population and water. So if you take these three factors together, this was a great and interesting. The red is, is where we basically don't have enough water you look on the bottom graph, I think this thing is still. So if you look on this graph, it's basically where we're going to run out of water uh, that's in the ground. And that's, that's pretty soon and pretty everywhere. Um, so water is going to be an issue. If it isn't even an issue where you are today, it will be an issue in the future. And it's something from a research perspective, we haven't seen a lot of, uh, I've seen one, one grant proposal on salt water this year, that was about it. So that's pretty important, but why is that important for you to know? Well, that, these are some of the things that you should be looking where to do research on. Uh, we talked about store to home delivery, so from the farm all, just right to the consumer. We talk, let's talk a minute bit about how the internet affects things. So you guys are used to the internet, not everybody here, I should say that, because I know somebody here is from China. Um, the internet in the United States, you've got one big guy, Amazon, who kind of controls what's going on. And he decides, 
I'm saying this a little big brotherish, but it's true. If you go to China, it's completely different. You've got one way, which is the Alibaba way, which is basically a gigantic flea market. And when we went in there to look at putting a, a uh, internet retail for cut flowers in China, we were competing with 10,000 retail florists on Alibaba. And talk about a silly American not being ready for that. We weren't ready for it, and we, went, we got out of there. We couldn't do it. We didn't know how to think that way. But guess what? That's the way the world is, and there's a lot more people in Asia on the internet than there is in the United States, so there's a quite a big likelihood it's gonna go that direction and not our direction. Uh, so it's interesting the way the internet may, may move. Farm to consumer, how does that affect research? Well, think about it. What, what things go wrong in, in flowers being shipped from a farm? Disease, temperature, packaging, there's all hormones, ethylene, there are all kinds of research opportunities there. So think about how you can do research in those areas. I'd love to see some, some, some people looking at how, how to make that work and not just thinking in the grower model only. Things you never thought of in demographics. Um, there is a I think I may have mentioned it somewhere. There's a great book, one of the best books I think I've ever read as it relates to research, is Where Good Ideas Come From, uh, by Stephen, Stephen Johnson, I think is, is, is the name. Is that, do you know which one I'm talking about? I yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure it's Stephen Johnson. And uh, he, that book is, is, if you want to read a book on how to do research, pick that one up, or how to get new ideas, pick that one up. It's the best one I've ever read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't really understand that. And what, do you think that's something about internet marketing can be covered that? Or what, what do you I'm going to give you, a, I'll give my opinion, and then we've actually got a couple people in the room that probably know much more about this specific question than I do. Uh, so I know, Jimmy, you, you, go, you grow poinsettias, and I know a couple of growers here, but let me give you my opinion first. Um, I don't think there are a lot of poinsettias sold uh, as a percentage of the total on the internet and shipped to consumers' houses. Um, I think the effect that you probably saw, which is uh, there's more units being sold, but the price has gone down, is because the economy in, since 2008 has gone up, and the Home Depots and the Lowe's of the world are, are selling more stuff. They sell a lot of poinsettias, and they have a huge buying power, so they keep going to the growers, and I want a better price. Uh, I'm guessing that's what's happening, but grow, growers in the uh, sitting down, tell me your opinions. So it's buyer power mainly. You, yeah, and the internet is. Do you, do you, what do you see as it relates to poinsettias when you grow there and as it relates to the internet? Yeah, okay. Pat. I don't think it's... Jim, one of the things that, looking at poinsettia specifically, yeah. nothing screams Christmas louder than poinsettia right. in a retail environment. And nothing screams a battle loop louder than a poinsettia price. Everybody remembers what the retail price point is on a poinsettia. Whether you're at Kroger, or you're at Walmart, or you're at or Home Depot, they remember that price point. Right. So it's that spiral, that race spiral to the bottom. That's right. Okay. Who can sell it the cheapest? Because it's an image item. Okay. That's why we're seeing more units being sold and the dollar value.
being sold in the mass market channel on prices, <coughs> okay, the lower the dollar value becomes. So it's, can I sell it cheaper than Jim? But the only way that Charlie can compete is to have a lower price than Jim. So right. we're in that race to the bottom because it's an image item, it's very specific, and nothing screams value, price value, Lost leader, right. The loss, yeah. the, so there's something called a lost leader. I sat, I sat in a bus a couple of years ago next to an unnamed head buyer from Home Depot. And he was talking to him about poinsettias, and he kind of chuckled to me. And I had said to him, I go, hey, you know, the prices of poinsettias have really gone down. And he, he said, yeah. And he goes, that's why I'm successful. And I said, tell me that. He goes, well, my company wants people in the door. We don't make money on poinsettias. We make money on the 20 other things they buy. So we sell those poinsettias at a loss in order to sell the other 20 things. So from he goes, I was successful. I got a raise because of it. I know all the growers are mad at me, but he said, you know, I got to do my job, and that was my goal. So I, it is complicated, but it's really about buyer power in that, in that case. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a problem. It is a prime it's a prime example of when part of the market gets too much power, and they start controlling pricing. And it's happened with Walmart. Uh, they actually stopped, but in the in the 90s, they put a lot of people out of business. They it takes time, but they actually had to get out of it. They didn't get out of it because they were making too much money. They got out of it because it was bad PR, <clears throat> public relations, bad bad reputation. <laughs> so I agree it doesn't make much sense on the grand scale. Usually those things work themselves out, but sometimes it takes 20 years, and we don't want to wait 20 years. But if you can figure that out, <laughs> I'll give you my card and you got a job. Because <laughs> that's a tough question that no one has really figured out the right way, the right answer. Please. And you know what ends up stopping, as part of it, what stops it is the market cycle. Growers stop growing them, because they lose money growing them, and they stop growing them, price goes up, price goes up, everyone puts them back in, and this is, that's the ag cycle, right? So that happens quite often with a lot of commodities, just not poinsettias. Great question. Let's talk. Uh, some pathways of research. So the traditional way, uh, which is, happens a lot now, it's university, company, consumer. So that means that you guys do a research project, and a company like me goes and say, that's pretty interesting. I'd like to license that, and I go make a product. And that's the way things have happened for many, many years. The non-traditional is the customer, the company and the customer get together, make a product, and go direct to the consumer. That's happening, that's effective. And then adjacent possible, we'll talk about that. Uh, ethyl block, which is an ethylene inhibitor, something I spent most of my research, part of my life on. I don't do research anymore, but when I did. And this was the traditional way. So we went to, Ed Sisler spent his whole entire life studying these molecules which inhibited ethylene. And one, he finally hit at it, and he was not a young guy when he hit at it. He was probably, I'm going to guess, in his was 70. 
And, and we thought it was interesting, went there, NC State, licensed it from him, and it worked great, it was a great product. Today it's a, a public company called AgriFresh, worth $800 million, of course I didn't get any of that, but, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a great success story of the way research works when you take university, company, consumer. The problem that I have now is there is no more basic research. And, the, and, and for sure, none in cut flowers and very little in potted and bedding plants. There's nothing to pick from anymore. So that worries me a lot as, as a business. So we need to look at other ways of doing this. Uh, here's another example. This is a product we just came out with. Um, we brainstormed with a, with a customer. We brought in some academics. We brought in some consultants. How do we do this? We took three days, put all the ideas, and then started doing research. We had all kinds of goofy things. We, had, we were going to sonicate stems. And I, of course, didn't say anything, even though I thought that was a terrible idea, because I don't want to sell sonicators. Uh, dips, chemicals. But we found some success. And what we did is we focused. So if I had six projects going on, I killed five of them. I told all those researchers, all your projects are done. I want you all to focus on this. And they did that. And we, we got a new product out, a new technology in two years. So instead of a lifetime, if we change the way we do things, and this would be really hard in academia because people have their, their worlds, but how could you figure out how to take the resources universities have, which are huge, and focus them on the opportunities which can be successful. I think here's an example of something you can get done in two years versus somebody's lifetime. The other is the adjacent possible. You've heard me say that a few different places. And that is just basically people can collaboration. Uh, when I started, when Smithers Oasis bought Flora Life, we had the foam experts, the flower experts, and made the big wall right here. So we decided to get everyone together. How can we make floral life in foam? People have been trying to do that for a long time, never successfully. What if we said forget about the foam part? Who cares? Let's pretend it's a vase. What would I put in there and make it the flowers last longer? And we figured out a way to do it, and it's now called Max Life. But it was about reframing and collaborating, and I think that that is a, a huge piece too. And how that happens in universities now and can happen is that group that I belong to where the professors get together and they present to everybody, but there's still fight to do that. On the lighting, we, we told two, two researchers, do us a favor, combine these two. They said, no, we're not gonna do it. And they, they didn't want the money just because they didn't want to combine it. Um, so collaboration is really important. And I think if we can figure out how to do that more at the university level, I think we can get more technologies. All right, let me see how are we doing on time. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. All right. Here is another way of, let me just, increasing the ways you look at an industry or how you in, can increase the ways you do research. Um, most universities today are still very grower oriented. The growers in the room hate me by now because I've said that. Uh, but I, and I like grower research, it's important. But I think if you, if you look at, and that's especially important in the old land grant schools because that's what they thought and that's the way they were taught to think. But reframe the way you think about markets, not by where it's grown, but by where it is. So instead of looking at the cut flower business or the potted business here, I want researchers to look at it all the way, all the way through all these opportunity points. If you look at all this research that's possible now, you've got so many places that you can make improvements in our whole industry. The potted business, the bedding in industry is the same. Don't look at it as just one piece. I, I want you to look at the whole value chain, where you can make a difference. There are opportunities for research everywhere in here. And I can tell you, everybody is here. And 
there is tons of opportunity here. So, so think about that. I like that old pen. Um, and, and how I, I looked at this, we look back at research. So since 1938 to 1990, Floral Life really only sold the retail, wholesale retail florists. That was all our business. Bill knows that. Um, worked with us back in the day. And we came up with about five new product lines related to flor related to cut flowers in 52 years. Not that impressive. So in the 90s, we started looking at that whole channel, the whole market, the whole value system. From the 90s to 2006, we came up with 15 products in, in, in 26 years, 21 years, sorry. That's a huge difference. If you look at the ability, we increased the ability to come up with new technologies by seven times just by changing the frame, by taking the, going from not just the grower but the whole value chain and where can I find opportunity in each one of those. And I think you guys can find a lot of research opportunity there. And I think. Uh, this, this is the last slide, so let me just say. So focus on the industry needs. Understand all of the industry, from the consumer all the way to where it's made, grown. Collaboration has got to be the way I think university research can go forward. Lots of opportunity, but if you, if you get stuck in the old way of, I have to do it all, um, I think it's going to fail. Uh, because not only is it it's just too slow, we need new technologies in a couple of years. I mean, think of Apple. Think of all these things you're used to seeing. Every, new year, the, every year there's a brand new technology. You guys love Apple so much, that's all I hear from him all day. <laughs> Uh, we need new technologies in the flower business, the, and the bedding, and the potting, and cuts. And we can't wait 50 years. We, need, we have years. So look, think of faster ways to do this. How can you collaborate to get new technologies out? And who is your customer? 